Hi. Um, you're obviously attracting a lot of attention these days with your NASA channel. Yeah, NASA took out NASA television on the internet. Mm -hmm. so. um, and we'd like to know a bit more about you. Uh, what's your background? What made you a sudden specialist with the specialist? with the shape of the Earth? Well, if I tell you it's a certain thing and without having an instrument to prove it for over a thousand years, let's say 500, I'll be generous, um, and there's no instrument or exploration of the surface, but you tell everybody it's that, um, if you're wrong, are you going to tell everybody? Good question. There's a lot riding here. Everybody who's got a degree in physics, uh, the credibility of every university institution over the past 500 years, um, the concept of uh, Darwinism, evolution, where we're from. If they lie about the shape, everything falls apart. Even the notion of scarcity, especially if there's more real estate, more land, more resources, more oil. What's your background, your studies? What? Self-taught. High realist painter. Started painting uh, at the age of three. So before my brain was uh, gotten a hold of by uh, curriculums and schools, I was already uh, well on my way in understanding perspective on the horizon line. I had to draw perspective, three-dimensional reality form. Uh, my goal at a very young age was to be able to reproduce paintings that looked like reality, like a camera took it. <laughs> it's just this weird fetish. I've always had, since I was very young, when you would look at an image, I would have a photo right next to the image, and I'd like, i really get off on confusing people whether they could just like, and I'd say, which one's the photo? And, they, and I, I would get off, it's been this freaky fetish I've always had, to, to watch people's eyes sort of scramble. And they would come up closer, and I'd be, no, 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 six feet, you have to decide from six feet. In this case, when it comes to a picture of the Earth from space, not only will no one ever go up in a rocket to, to check out if it does look like that, but it's, it's more than the distance of six feet. So you were hired by NASA not because of your knowledge in astronomy, just because of your talent at painting? They enjoyed the way I, uh, I painted things to make things look real, like my understanding of light, how I could take uh, something that doesn't exist in reality after a certain point I surpassed needing photos and I could basically construct things that don't exist, understanding how light would hit form. And they recruited me uh, after a very sad, after I, I graduated from political science intelligence at a Jesuit school in uh, Canada, known as St. Francis Xavier. They recruited me at a uh, university exhibition. And what was your job like? Well, in the beginning it was like, We'd like to see some samples of textures and stuff like that. And uh, they started really pushing me into using, uh, you know, uh, different types of, of spill effects and stuff like that. Uh, they already had a, an idea, like, they seem to already have this uh, system of textures or ways to make textures. So they asked me to, I guess I was just filling in on somebody else's work, like a predecessor who went into retirement. And once in a while I would get um, calls from a gentleman who was the head of the, the graphics department and uh, you know, we'd ask them to change the color on things or the lighting. And then what they would do is they would send me like uh, a drawing or an architectural drawing of like uh, um, an instrument that might be scouting the surface of a, of a celestial body, be it a moon or a planet. And then they would ask me to transpose these objects on the textures and, and they would give me certain directions of, like the light is at this angle, this time of the day, uh, at this intensity, and then I would have to make the shadows congruous to the information they would make and I'd have to make it look real. And can you explain to us what happened between your steady job that you just described and... It wasn't steady. It was on and off and it was freelance. Okay. And what happened between that period and now? 
What is the turning point that made you totally dissociate yourself from what you were a, working uh, for? Uh, was it about a year after I met uh, some of the people I was working with over the phone and on computer and at a uh, function. And I think it was kind of like somewhat of an initiation um, to this division of NASA. And um, there was one gentleman there that didn't work for NASA, but he was like a consultant for the U.S. Defense Department, GPS, and, uh, and NASA. And uh, he was a physicist and a painter. Very interesting combination. He was a well-known astrophysicist and a uh, photorealist painter. Um, most people in the mainstream know him as a, as a, well, not even the mainstream, but in the physics circles. Uh, know of him as a scientist, but they didn't know he had this uh, knack of photorealistic painting. And it's something they kind of kept under wraps. With me, however, I was a you know, old, you know, very good photorealist painter. I would say I was better than him. And I was better at recreating textures that don't exist. Um, and there was a party uh, at somebody's cottage in the uh, Hamptons. And the power went out, and it was about say about one o'clock in the evening, and there was one gentleman who was friends with this guy, who was this consultant for the U.S. Defense Department. Now, this guy was basically um, a friend of one of my superiors and a colleague. And uh, basically, they started to, I think the conversation started turning around like, something was like, GPS coordinates weren't working or something concerning Antarctica, and so then he made a crack. This gentleman was working for them both as a consultant, so it was like, I was like, well, so you should go out there and, you know, just and check this thing out, see if it's, like, if it's still functional. And then somebody made a quip to the effect that, well, if he goes out that far, he ain't coming back. And, and uh, I asked, like, well, what do you mean, like, well, why wouldn't he come back? If it's like, if he can go back on his, because GPS doesn't reach that far. And then I was like, well, why doesn't GPS reach that far? I mean, is it too cold? And it's like, it's because it's flat. And they started laughing. They were all, and they all started laughing. And uh, my superior had a, quite a weird smirk on his face. He was watching me to see how I would take all this. And there was no lights on, and they had candles that they just lit. And it basically, he took out some chalk. And uh, it was like, a cement sort of plank floor of some sort, and he started drawing out the earth, all the continents exactly, but how they would, how they function, uh, everything, physics, science, how everything we understand in movement of energy and objects uh, in this new or hidden uh, science, hidden from the public, um, how everything is, is caused by temperature as opposed to like this very evasive notion of, of energy with uh, Einstein and, and uh, Hawking that you know there's three ingredients to make a universe energy mass and uh, energy mass and uh, and, uh, and space it was uh, temperature. temperature was why there's mass and energy and you believed him right away it made a lot of sense but he basically started to vert everything. And they were kind of laughing, but they were very, very, they were listening to him. He seemed to be like, kind of like this guy who was just this weird, I thought he was some sort of nut that these guys, like he was basically just like, taking apart everything that they know or that they say every day in the office. He was basically explaining the flat earth and how it works. And uh, he literally drew the UN flag. And I thought they, this is a joke on me. This is some sort of initiation to see if I'm stupid or to see if I'm going to buy this. I, I thought they were fucking playing with me to see if I would, if they could convince me it was flat. And what was creepy about the whole thing is that they were more laughing at me for not getting it. It never went back to it being a ball with these gentlemen that night. It might have been that at the office the next day, in front of everybody else, you know, the underlings, but, uh, and then for weeks, I couldn't think 
I, I, everywhere I went, I, every time I saw the picture of the earth, it was like some just a logo. It was a painting. It was like, it was a graphic. And then I started to scrutinize the actual images of the earth they claim are photos. And it just started looking silly, like a cartoon. Like, why is the water so blue if it's reflecting the blue atmosphere, but I can still see mm -hmm. the brownness of Africa? Like, wouldn't I be seeing Africa through the blue atmosphere? Like, why is the green and the brown of continents so clear with the blue of the water when the water of the oceans is just reflecting the blue atmosphere? And how come the whole thing, being three parts water, isn't reflecting the blackness of space? Like, it really, I started seeing all these flaws. And the more and more I tried to prove this guy wrong, or just to find out if they were joking or pulling my leg, the more I realized they weren't joking. What do you think you were the one that they spoke about? That they, they, that they told that to? I think there was some projects coming up down the pipeline. The Mars, uh, a few things that they were, they wanted to know. I think the whole thing was to see how I would play ball. Like, let him in on it. He'll ask more questions and we'll see how, we'll study his reaction. And if he has the proper reaction to maybe be part of the deception, um, we'll let him in on the next project, the next contracts that we want him to falsify, the next images we need him to counterfeit. How many people were told the same information in the, in the These company? guys were all privy to it, but these guys were all high-placed people at NASA and the U.S. Defense Department. Any other colleagues of your uh, level that were aware also? No. Everybody at my level was um, doing graphics, doing prototypes, and just they would never believe and what am I gonna do? <laughs> what am I I'm gonna tell them? Well then they're gonna tell them. So I was really alone in this situation. And uh, I did more and more research and then this every time I came up to where to prove an equation, it was supported by an event that was that was created through mass media caused by NASA. Be it the moon landing, be it this, and then it was the moon rocks and then Van Brower going to Antarctica to pick up rocks like two years before the first moon mission. Then the rocks just like looked like, and then it came out a couple years ago that uh, Glenn, uh, John Glenn, when he went on this world tour to sort of like do a PR campaign, hey, he went to the moon and he gave rocks to the Queen of England and she gave those rocks or she gave those rocks to the museum in Amsterdam and up until a couple years ago they found out that was just petrified wood. It wasn't a rock from, a, from the moon at all. So, I mean, like, everything's starting to come out now, but it's said once in the newspaper, almost like it's a revelation of the method, a hee-hee on everybody, but... And how did you deal with having the information in your head and continuing to work on the projects well, you, were, uh, you were hired for? Well, after a while, um, extensions changed, numbers were dead, and I was not acknowledged. I didn't get through. I mean, even people I worked with, um, the agency said that they never even worked for them. Uh, so the whole thing looks like it's just like, so I look crazy. You know what I mean? Like I'm telling you, like the guys I work with when I call back, you know, didn't, like the agency saying they don't, they never worked for them, which I pretty much imagine is what they're going, they're saying right now, or what they were going to say about me was the same thing. Um, I mean, go ahead, call them up, ask if Matt Boylan, the, the comedian, uh, ever drew, drew paintings for NASA. I watched this deception continue and everybody invisibly worship a painting, like, a, like some sort of religious icon. Because that's what it is, that no one's ever going to see it at that distance, and yet it's taken for granted. That's it, yeah, that's the earth. They're never going to go to the North and South Pole. Well, the South Pole is really how this conspiracy works. Because it's really 360 degrees around our continents, which huddle around the North Pole. We know that you're very vocal these days about this I topic. I also became but very vocal to protect myself. When is the first time you actually spoke about it? Live? With a, to another person. It was live? No. <laughs> Well, at first I had a girlfriend, we're no longer together, she worked for the government, and uh, 
Um, she was actually there. She was at the, uh, the party when the power went out and then this conversa conversation happened. And so, if she wasn't there, and then I came home and told her this, she would have thought I was nuts. But because there was some very influential, highly placed government officials working internationally, um, I had someone to, to exchange with on this, on this concept. Um, our relationship collapsed. It didn't work for other reasons. Um, but the exchange of like the fascination, the discovering, it was, it was literally like discovering a whole new planet and the romance of, of, of Columbus and how things really work. Energy, science, temperature, how much land is there? Like, is everybody just following GPS corridors in the oceans and in the air? Yes. Do all the commercial flights hub through the Northern Hemisphere? Yes. And finding out how they plug all these holes so no one will find out. I bounced it through a few people who had very high praise in my talent. And I had to explain to them very, very um, precariously because I didn't want them to know I was actually doing graphics for them. I wasn't allowed to tell anybody that I was actually working for them doing freelance graphics. You know, because I, it's perjury. It's basically, I'm, I'm putting my neck out and I'm also like apparently putting the national security uh, of the country or the nation or the agency at risk by talking about, you know, the projects I was on. I, mean, I was just making paintings of outer space. Some people tend to believe that you're talking this way, you're proposing such a thing just to attract the attention. Big time. Uh, the more people that hear me say this, the more time I'm buying for myself. So you don't mean it, you just want to attract the attention? Is this what you're I'm saying? I'm trying to live, protect myself, and also... Uh, what do you need to protect yourself? I think the more people know this, the better off they'll be, humanity will be. Um, look, it's been 500 years. People go, wow, you're telling me to go, not only go back 500 years when we used to think it was flat, actually it was way before that. And I mean, everybody's in a dream. Their reality is, is from the military. This cannot continue. The militaries of this world uh, are what is dividing and conquering everybody in these little eugenics events they call world wars. And basically, instead of rounding up people and then firing them because they're stupid and there's too many of them and they're eating everything, why don't you just let them know there's more land? Do you think you're reacting right now the way they planned you would react? No. How do you think? think how do you think they they were hoping I would react? Yes. Well, I think that they were hoping that I would like laugh and be part of the group, the illuminated, and uh, all right. So let's have a good like slap on the back and uh, let's see how far we can take this lie and uh, keep it from them. While we how far do you slides. think? They would have sent you in the other direction if you would have. I don't just know what they were planning. Um, they could have used me to, I don't know, maybe f stage a false alien invasion, uh, uh, mixing fantasy visuals with uh, android technology or nanotechnology. There, you know, there's fusion going on too with smoke and mirrors. You know, it's not just illusion with images, and uh, it's there's actual technology going on here. So when you're fusing the two together, I mean, holographs in the sky, the holographic uh, uh, events. You were talking earlier about uh, the need to protect yourself. Why would you need to protect yourself now that you have uh, I embraced this? Because I, 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 I decided to keep this within the council of people that I trust and then basically get my argument and take stock of everything that just happened. And once I knew how I was going to like, what was really going on, what happened to me, what they were planning, and what has been done for the past 500 years, 
Then it was about sharing counsel with very, very smart individuals close to me and developing a way to release this worldwide. Through comedy, for example. Pretty much. How could we take you seriously since you're a stand-up comic now? Well, I think the key here is you don't take me seriously. It's just a show, and we're in a free society. So, I should be allowed to say whatever I want. I can't believe this guy is like a judge. I can't believe judges are judges. I can't believe... I wish, there's so many laws now, I wish I could pass a law to stop the laws. You know, but you can't because the laws are passing the laws and the people. It means when a judge says, you're out of order. You're out of order, young man. You're not... Da, 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 da. It's like, I'm, I'm out of order. You're the one with the fucking white wig. <laughs> on that high desk with a wooden hammer and a black dress. <laughs> fucking weirdo. <laughs> Or you're crazy. <laughs> you're wearing a white wig, Your Honor, and you got a wooden hammer, and you're getting mad, and you hit it. <laughs> Fucking who's nut bar here? <laughs> you're out of order, buddy. I mean, you're a fucking throwback from like the medieval era. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> got somebody from the medieval era telling me I'm not sane or something. That's great with the white wig and the dress. So where do you stand? Would be my next question. Do you think it's funny? Do you want to play with people's mind, or well, you don't believe it? It is extremely funny on many levels. Such Take as the one you want. Well, it's funny for them because they're laughing at everybody. It's funny for me because I get to laugh at them failing at fooling the world, and I'm letting them in on it. It's funny for me to know and anticipate how the, the Star Trek, NASA file, Einsteinian ast astronaut nerds are going to react to me proposing this. And then already knowing their comments, their stupid insults, their fanatic reactions when they can't handle what I'm saying. So it's yeah. funny in that level. So it's like every day I wake up, I open up the NASA channel, I look at the comments, and I'm literally battling zombies that are what is, at me. What is the worst, uh, the worst comment we've ever made? Uh, any uh, insults or threats? Well, I find that now the com well, there's always the, the generic uh, get your tinfoil hat um, or put your tinfoil hat, and they all think they're original. I just don't. I don't approve those comments. I do approve comments on it. I, I, I pen for approve it, uh, approval because um, I would just want to debate. I don't want fanatics like Star Trek fanatics or heliocentric Einstein Newtonian freaks who just repeat what they were told in some school program um, and never went anywhere in a fucking rocket or at NASA insulting me. So I keep the debate. And if you have like a conventional response to what I'm saying, I will show you the other way. Yes, and in the... But when it comes to threats, um, I find that just completely freaky. And now, since I've been doing this, I've been taking this worldwide in front of audiences, now there's uh, inadvertent sort of uh, threats on my life being made. Like, you will die. Accidents will happen. Um, How do you deal with this? I deal with it like I'm dealing with a fanatic. Because a fanatic is someone who uh, will have um, an irrational, highly negative, emotional, borderline violent reaction to just questioning their belief system. I wait for the day where everybody will throw out that religious symbol called the globe. The globalists all stop. How do you see it as a re religious symbol? Well, when you have that kind of fanatic reaction to saying it's not that, and you actually stand your ground proving how it's clever events, orchestrated by one group to support Newton, a 
Copernicus, the fact that we actually go around the sun. And don't go snooping around Antarctica unless you're a scientist approved by the Southern, Southern Treaty Project. And uh, you'll, it's funny because you'll never see anybody actually talk bad about the Pentagon who work at the Pentagon or at NASA. It's like they're supposed, we're supposed to believe that these are the only org these organizations, everything's hunky dory, and everybody just has a, a great work environment. There's no complaints, there's nothing weird going on there. People better wake up. These, when you work at NASA, you sign very, very strict confidentiality agreements uh, when you're working in any department, uh, especially the Pentagon. Your life is at risk. This is one of the reasons why, uh, well, one of the reasons why when I was recruited, first as freelance to do texture graphics, nebulous texture graphics, almost like they would do these sort of um, texture samples that they could use in layer masking when creating, st I didn't know this at the time, uh, but I would send in these textures. They would be paint spills and different things. And sometimes they would ask for a realistic rendering of like a, you know, a, a moonscape or what it would be like. They would say it's got, you know, Europa is ice and da da da. And they would explain, you know, the temperature and what they were looking at and the light intensity of where it would be juxtaposed to, uh, to Jupiter with where the sun would be at a certain time of the year. And then my job was to realize this realistically, right? Uh, much like Stanley Kubrick, you know, took all of Newtonian physics and the way we view the universe in the 20th century before they even went up in a rocket and made it look real on screen. So, um, and a lot of people do this when they're like doing the renderings for like, you know, new shuttles, uh, new, new prototype equipment, uh, what it would look like, how it would work. Everything in the world is drawn first. Money is drawn. The most important things that rule your mind are drawn. The dollar bill is drawn. The Queen of England on a pound. Um, flags. Um, and in this case, we have an image everybody veneers and worships invisibly. Because it becomes worship when it becomes iconic and you've never seen it from that point of view. Like Christ, or God. We've never seen the Earth from the distance and outer space looking back at it that we so associate as Earth as a ball from that moon mission. And there are certain things that have come to my, my trained eye that are inconsistent with how the UV spectrum in our gaseous Earth's atmosphere creates a blue spectrum, works when reflecting the blackness of outer space and seeing the clear brown and greenness of continents while seeing the clear blueness of oceans and yet not seeing the contours of a continent through the bluish atmosphere that is our, our Earth's air. So these things don't make sense. Um, also, when they show 3D uh, rotation what they claim is uh, satellite tracking footage of the Earth in rotation, time-lapse speed, sped up. The clouds aren't morphing and changing. If I were to film clouds from the Earth's point of view, looking up over the course of a day, rolling in and rolling out, or keep my camera trained on a cloud, I mean, keep your eye trained on a cloud while you lie down in a field, it will morph and change. change. 